Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name's Mark Malcolmson. I have the huge honor and privilege of being the principal at City Lit, uh, broadcasting from my front room in my house in West London. Um, during the course of the last two years, um, we've been doing um, various talks and lectures called City Lit Perspectives. And they tend to be around current events. Um, they are asking for perspectives from somebody who has great knowledge in the area. And they um, are to challenge our assumptions, to aid us, to help us, etc. cetera. Um, with the lockdown as a result of the pandemic, uh, we decided that actually we wanted to continue that series, although we usually do them in places like the British Museum and the Guildhall and go somewhere iconic in London. Um, this time, we've decided our community and our wider community are able to find and get support through us online. So I'd like to welcome the many hundreds of people who have signed on today for this. The first um, lecture we did online was about um, six weeks ago. Um, Sir Vince Cable, uh, former leader of the Liberal Democrats and also a renowned economist, came and talked about the economy and the pandemic. And today I am genuinely delighted, truly delighted, one of my all-time favorite people, Ruby Wax, who is a fellow of City Lit. Fellows of City Lit are people that have a, a great um, attachment to our hearts. They're people that are deeply committed to adult education. They're people that um, help and support us and advocate for us. And Ruby has been a fellow now for four years. Um, she spoke at our first mental wealth festival um, five years ago and did a, a wonderful session then. Um, Ruby and I have interviewed, I've interviewed her in, in London, in Barcelona. It's, it's just, it's one of those just fabulous relationships. And she just brings such amazing insight. And particularly at this point, particularly when we're making that transition from what was strict lockdown to a, a, an uncertain world of re-emerging. And that, that whole process could take many more months. Um, there's a lot of talk and a lot of comments around uh, mental health, well-being, mental well-being, the attachment to physical well-being as well. And that's why Wing City Lit, we wanted to bring that, that topic here as a perspectives conversation. So the format is going to be as follows. Um, a number of you have sent questions already. If those of you who are new to Zoom, there is a little function at the bottom called Q&A. That will send us questions. Unfortunately, because of the many hundreds of people on the call, um, we're not able to have you ask questions directly. It kind of doesn't work that way. Otherwise, we'd just be bombarded and not be able to hear each other. So at the moment, everybody's on mute. If you want to um, send us questions, we will try and filter them. I've got a little team working with me uh, behind the screens to um, help feed me the questions. I've already got 12 from people have already sent in advance and I'm gonna go through them. And we're gonna see where we go with this. Also, you will see my wonderful colleague, Charmaine. She has to now say wonderful colleague about herself and gets embarrassed when I do that. Um, we have a one amazing deaf community at City Lit and a hard of hearing community. Many of them are logged on today. And so Charmaine will be interpreting both Ruby's and Mai's um, word. Um, and uh, that gives us an opportunity really to kind of reach out to many different communities. So that's where I want to start. But before I, I kind of launch in with Ruby, what we're doing, this is a free event. Um, what we're also encouraging people, we have a bursary at City Lit to enable people who maybe not have the means to be able to come to us as um, other students are. And we support them both in terms of their fees, but also in terms of maybe their transport costs, et cetera. And we've got a little 90 second video just to give you a sense of what that's like. So if you bear with us a second, um, and uh, we hope that the video will come through now. I knew I was creative from a, a really early age, but I kept it within myself because I wasn't sure of myself and who I was. Sitilit has allowed me not to be afraid of myself. 
we are so talented as human beings, but we, we tend to limit ourselves. The bursary, it, it helps so many students in, in such a big way. It can help somebody who is feeling crap about themselves and it gives them the ability to want to live and to continue coming to college, learning something new, meeting so many people. It gives you a second chance. Coming here and getting the bursary is the best thing I've ever done in my life because my soul is actually singing. It's like I'm living again. Brilliant. Thank you. That just gives you a little context for those who are new to the college, um, because I know it's gone to a wider audience than just our usual students. But without further ado, I would like to welcome our great friend, Ruby Wax, and thank her so much for giving up her time in her room. Um, and uh, it's lovely to see people in their natural habitats as well. Usually we're on a stage with microphones, with an audience there, and now I can see what type of art you have. And It's not my house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, okay. You've broken into somebody's. I have done because I didn't want you to see my house. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. Ruby, we've, we've worked together now on, on mental health with you and the college for the last five years. When we first started, you were one of the pioneers. There was, there was you, there was Alistair Campbell, who helped us get our mental wealth festival going. And we've really seen a change in um, how mental health is viewed during that time. A lot more people are a lot more open. A lot more people are talking about it from princes to footballers, et cetera. Um, so it'd be really interesting to have your view of how that change has happened. And then if you think about the last 14 weeks, do you think the openness has been accelerated or do you think, you know, how do you think this period has added to that five years? Has it moved us on or not? Mm. You know, we've, since we're all siloed a little bit to, for, for me to get a view on what, what's happened with the world, it's, it's, it's difficult. So I can only say through my telescope, by the way, this is where I live. Sorry, I didn't want you to, <laughs> it's not in London, but it's just my room where I write in. So that's, that's okay just so you know. It's just one room. It's not a house. It's a little nano house. I needed to explain that. All right. So where mental health, when I started about 15 years ago, I did a show on stage. And in the second half, the audience would stand and ask questions or I, you know, and I don't remember in the beginning, I think they were hesitant, but towards uh, the end. And some of these theaters are you know, a thousand seaters, you couldn't shut people up. And so that wave of um, kind of like it was gay pride, but now it's about their mental health issues. You could feel that um, tsunami starting to build. And to me, that was, you know, to get a real slice of what's happening in, in, the, in the public's mentality. I don't know if that's in little crevices all over the country, but certainly it's right in the face of the government. So they're always sort of saying, yes, yes, we're dealing with mental. Now they have to say the word mental health, you know, as if it really exists. Because before, I think they thought that we're a physical body with an air bubble that says things like, um, you know, it's either I feel really nice or I've broken. You know, they, they couldn't understand something so simple that mental is physical. You know, your brain is part of the whole, you know, package. So why would this get less attention? And they never put together, you know, I mean, I, maybe because I studied it, that everything that happens, not only in your body, but in the world is because of just this organ. So I don't understand why people didn't take it seriously. You know, if you fix the mothership, crime, addiction, diabetes, uh, you know, certain cancers, uh, abuse, everything falls into place. So it was something everybody was always avoiding, but the numbers are now mounting. You know, it, it is one in four, and now we're in a, we're, I don't want to spread, there's enough bad news, but, um, it's almost, uh, the, the doors have been unlocked. And I think it's, well, I'm certainly now doing projects, not just for the one in four, but the four in four, because there's going to be a pandemic. I don't want to depress anybody, but um, we had to just take care of one in four before, maybe. 
because everybody was busy. But when you take the busyness away, and now people had time to reflect in to their own inner state, it's not mental illness, it's a mental, we are frazzled. And, and frazzled is a neurobiological word, I didn't make that up. It's such a great word, it means stressed about stress. So we're all supposed to feel emotions. There's somebody came up with, we're supposed to feel nothing. You feel um, stress, you feel anxiety, you feel fear, if somebody dies, you feel sad, but frazzled is feeling anxious about anxiety. And this is a new phenomenon. It's a soundtrack that we've done something wrong. That's now creating the next illness. It's not mental illness, but it does just as much damage on the, you know, the cortisol damage and the fallout in economics and in crime and in personal health is going to be phenomenal. So now we really have to address it. They can't turn their heads away. I mean, I guess the economy is a pretty big concern, <laughs> but behind the economy are human beings. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I was, I was deeply impressed by Sadiq Khan as mayor being so open in his interview at the weekend around how this particular circumstance, there is a man who has been hugely busy for the last three years as mayor, um, hugely committed, busy with people around him all the time and, and feeding off that classic extrovert in a lot of ways, the way he describes himself. And now kind of going into lockdown has really been difficult for him. And I think the more people tell their stories and more people actually kind of make it relatable. I mean, we're not all the mayor of London and we don't all have a little entourage walking around with us and we don't have to go to lots of things. But you're absolutely right. I think this, this idea of busyness and, um, and constantly having to do things has become a way of, I think one of the phrases, we're human, we've become human doings rather than human yeah. beings. And I think that's a lovely kind of phrase. And this, this pause, I, I suppose this question is, the fact that people have now had more time and more space to reflect, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, is that having to face your demons potentially? What do you think? Come on, you're running a, the smartest yeah. place in town. You know, who said uh, a life, um, an un, uninvestigated life was not worth living on, on what's, you know, Socrates, what's his name? Yeah. Last name. No, I know, but um, you, you know what I'm saying. There is no life unless you look inside. And we have gotten in the habit of just accumulating. And uh, so now uh, in our lifetimes, we've paid the bill. Uh, if you want to keep accumulating, the world's still out there. You can go. But a lot of people, and I'll tell you why I, I'm in touch with this, have busted themselves to go, wait a minute. I was living like a maniac. Do I want to live like that um, anymore? And now we really have to rethink. I mean, what an opportunity. This hasn't happened for, <laughs> when did this ever happen? I mean, before the privileged could look in or there was a philosopher or, but you know, we have been running like a rat race to create this, uh, you know, kind of Kafkaesque metropolis of technology, which is magnificent. Nobody's happier than I am, but we forgot about ourselves. And now the day of reckoning came yeah, you could have used this time to look in and really evolve, or you could have used this time and gone mad. Or you can put it all behind you and just go back to how it was. But I'm really behind the people that use it and evolved in secret behind the doors. An unexamined life. You know that. Come on, I was trying to help you. I know. It's exactly how I'm, I'm a great believer in that. I'm a great believer in the sort of self-reflection piece. I mean, it leads to me one of the questions that we've had is, is you know, one of our one of our audiences sort of said, "Look, um, I have good days and I have bad days, but they, they it's much more of a roller coaster than it was when I was out doing things." Yeah, you think and it was. You think it was. Um, you know that everything was status quo, but it was an illusion. You know now people are face to face with uncertainty. It was always uncertain. You didn't know if you were gonna, but you didn't have to face it. Clearly, you're not the same person now as the one who you know. Um, was crawling on all fours, but humans are trained to not see change. Now, the rude awakening has slapped us in the face, so it's the existential crisis. Um, and I think, as horrifying as it is, it doesn't feel good, but this is, this is um, examining your life. That's the most important thing a human can do. Is that what you meant? In terms of coping strategies, I mean, what have you found 
useful. Obviously, you've done a lot of work already, both in your studies, but also your self-examinations. But a lot of people are kind of coming new to this. If you're, you're relatively early on in, in looking at yourself and looking at your sort of psyche and how it's reacting to this, what, what, are, what are, in your view, are the good beginner's coping mechanisms that people can help with? You know, it's, it, it's not so much a coping mechanism. It's going back to what comes also with the human equipment, which besides fight or flight and the ability to claw something to death with our minds, because we don't have extensions like teeth, is, um, is community. And because, uh, I, you know, I have found a real cause during this time. Do you mind if I talk about it now? No, absolutely. Um, I started something four years ago called Frazzle Cafes, which actually were meeting places in cafes up and down the UK, small groups of about 12 with a facilitator. And they meet regularly in cafes, Marks and Spencer's and free coffee and cookies. And they could speak from the heart. And it was like the, you know, getting back with the tribe in a way, because I did feel incredibly lonely all my life. And I always think speaking, you know, or saying something to other people is half the cure, but we have to live in such, a lot of people don't want to bother with their friends and family because they don't want to show weakness. Somehow we got weakness in there, uh, confused with vulnerability. But anyway, I even went to those groups and it was like, I guess what Quakers felt or something, you were connected with all ages, all races, Whatever your thing was, you could really feel that underneath all this plumbing and this skin, you know, whatever I design I was, you know, got, is, is a human heart. And, we're, and that, that's the lesson we need to learn. So because of the lockdown, I, Frazzle Cafe has gone online. So I do 100 people a day. And then there are smaller groups all day at all times where people, it's all free you can meet up with 12 people. You go on frazzlecafe.org. I have to tell you, this has given me uh, a hope in mankind. And I feel closer to these people that I've never met before than I do with a lot of my friends. There's no crap. There's no whining. You know, you always think, oh, well, now humans, we are not allowed to talk about the news. Like, guess what happened? Because that just stokes us into fury. You know, we've, we, you know, you're not, but you're, the, you didn't have to go to school for this. People really know how to speak from the heart when they feel safe. And it's magnificent what they say. Each person is a kind of, some are rich, some are poor, some are, one woman is not gonna be with us very much longer. She has something terminal. They're really young and they completely connect. Now, if that's not a reason to live, and that's not so hard, you don't have to make money for that. Um, and I really think it's the beginning, not because it's mine, but this is the beginning of a new era. If we can just pay attention that we're a team, we're not each man for himself. That's so that's the you actually beautifully, Ruby. Um, by the way, repeat the, the URL for the cafe. So you go to frazzledcafe.org. Frazzled you cafe. I'll get you to a meeting and uh, either one of mine, which is daily, not Sunday, and all day, uh, most days to a smaller meeting. And the lovely thing is, is that you're no longer physically limited to go to the one in your local neighborhood. You can actually be meeting people from Middlesbrough and Centre Island. From all over the world now. You yeah. know, I mean, this even uh, incorporates the, the, the notion we are a community. There's nobody cares about what color you are. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting thing. As you, as you know, City Lit is, is a wonderful organization. I, I'm not just paid to do that. I say that. It's actually something I believe deep in my heart. Um, and we're about learning. And actually, it's hugely important whether you do one of the 6,000 courses. But one of the things I found, which is, is so beautiful to watch in my nine years as being principal, is the cafe. And, and you obviously have Frazzle Cafes. But it's where, you know, you will get people and you'll get somebody who is probably very affluent, somebody who is potentially going to Harrods or the opera in the evening or the evening sitting next to somebody who might have been rec in recovery, who might have been homeless. And it's a great equalizer. And I think there's a huge relief for people, not necessarily just to be in their own little silo, yeah. to actually get a community that's much more random. Well, than you have a, it's funny, a cafe. And there used to be town halls or maybe libraries when you could talk in them or, um, it, it, that's what we're missing. Where's the community? 
you know, go to theater, everybody's facing forward. Churches and stuff, you know, we don't want to, religion doesn't have to do with it. It's human. I mean, I'm, this is my obsession. And because you can feel it when it's there. No yeah. question. You can feel it. I think it's also interesting. You've seen bookshops over the last decade have coffee shops in them instead of it being oh, the classic. You know, I mean, there should be the sign that says, please talk. Yes. What are you um, looking in your book and you're on your phone? Now the next step is talk. So, so you've got your cafes going. That's how you've sort of helped the community. Well, work. It'll keep going. I mean, this shouldn't. This should just burgeon. And do you think that post-pandemic the cafes will stay both online and also return? Um, we're not going to have it in a cafe anymore. It's no, because it's it's got to move too quickly, and we want more and more and more smaller groups. And I just feel there was a gap in the market. You know, one in four were to kind of, you know disgust. I don't know what the gov. you know, we know that they always needed help, <laughs> you know, these one in four and money was promised and they weren't. Now I know that there are some places online because we direct people to it where you can get online therapy. It's not enough, but it's for the one in four. I'm trying to fill the gap for the three and four, which is everybody. Um, and if that doesn't start, uh, at least calming down that frazzled brain, which, which human connection does. You don't have to learn a tool. Human, it automatically, we work like neural Wi-Fi. I don't know who said that expression. We calm each other down. Um, if, we don't, if we don't find something for the three and four, as I say, I, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but the word, um, if you think there's, <laughs> I'm so used to people really, there will be, um, what can I say? An another little bit of a pandemic where people will go crazy because the f we, don't, we don't have tools how to deal with this. Are we supposed to believe everything's going back to normal now? You know, clearly all these things like we've done, a l it has to be discussed. You have to process trauma. This has been a trauma. So if you don't have a place to talk about it, you're gonna carry it around like a grenade. Well, and actually, I, I want to explore that a little bit. I've got some very specific questions about the people of that thing, but but this this idea of the whole and this this trauma that we've been through, I, I think that's not not enough people are talking about that. They're talking about individual challenges, but actually, this has been collective trauma. Um, the certainly the first few weeks of the uncertainty and lockdown about whether when the R rate was rising massively, people were very concerned, did I go into lockdown and am I incubating? You know, the, the journey and the roller coaster has been really difficult for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I think it's then when it's how, how it's been difficult, those people who are locked down with families that are good yeah. and it functions, that's been mitigated some way. Those who are in abuse, I mean, the, the epidemic around spousal abuse and child abuse that's happened as a result of this is going to be something that we live with for many decades. Um, but also the, the loneliness piece. I think that of the people who have been on their own week in, week out, yeah, they've had their Zoom calls, et cetera, but literally there is something around the physical sight of somebody you know that obviously fires bits of your brain that staring at a computer or being on the phone doesn't do it. No. You're, you're very, the, the thing I love about you is, is you very much humanize the neuroscience. Um, you know, this isn't just aromatherapy candles by the side of the bath and listening to Dido, that you actually go, no, there's, there's real stuff behind this. So tell me about what you think about that lack of human connection and how, how that has hurt us as, as individuals in a society. Well, that's interesting. You know, that stuff, I don't want to be sound all, you know, fancy schmance uh, because, you know, I, I was interested in the brain and you guys are all, you know, I always, I like the science because if I can't see it or taste it, I don't, I don't buy it. You know, if a dream catcher worked and it caught my dreams, I'm, I'll, I'll order them in bulk. Um, but so that's why I love neuroscience. At least it gives an explanation. You may say, well, science is also fantasy, but I, I get off the bus there. I, I do think it might be true. Um, is that we need that o oxytocin that we, you know, we are only reacting to each other through chemicals. You know, if you, 
excite me or whatever. There'll be a chemical, doesn't matter what you say, I've already switched the chemical on. It's got nothing to do with you. And then other ones make, you know, you remind me of somebody. We are so out of control with what is driving this such a complex brain, you know what I mean? Like a lot of times we don't even react to the person in front of us, it's who they remind us of. So a, a whole story comes into here. But the oxytocin is, is primitive. You know, we, you have it when you have a baby, your mother has it for you, she grows your brain through that, uh, you know, uh, what is it, a kind of cha-cha of love back and forth and, and that's how you develop. So now you, the question is, can we feel that online? And I never thought you could, you know, everybody hated tech, they said tech was gonna be over. The point is in the lockdown, you had no choice. So typical humans, oh, maybe we should have, I missed it. Everybody did, of course. But with a lot of people, because I've been talking to my, with Zoom on Zoom, is um, when we were together, we didn't look at each other. I didn't notice people either. You know, you'd have family gatherings and then, but your mind was somewhere, oh God, I gotta write something. Oh, I better do something. Did I buy that thing? Even when you were with people, we weren't focused because we were, what somebody called it, we were at the mercy of weapons of mass distraction. And so by accident, now you're on Zoom. Now you got nothing else to do. You can't go on the phone because we're talking to each other. And suddenly I feel that flowing. You can feel it. Uh, there's like a, maybe if we meet and we hug, it'll be even better. But a lot of people say, this is the, the next best thing to hugging. Except these are strangers. You couldn't get away with that. Um, so I do believe, well, look, can I be crude? People get excited sexually by looking at something online. So don't tell me that it stops the hormones. You can fall in love, you watch a film, you cry, you whatever. It's not the answer. But let's acknowledge that you might just be focused on people more. In some cases, we can't keep it up online than we were offline. I think there's an interesting bit. One guy, sorry, one guy said by doing the Zoom, he's training himself for compassion. He's training his compassion. So when he gets off, he'll be able to focus it. It's a good training. Uh, Last week, I had a couple of colleagues and I had to go back into the college to start working on some health and safety things. And after not having seen them, I, I adore my colleagues, is I wanted to hug them. And then suddenly, you're, you can't. The world has changed. So it, it's not even, I think, I think a lot of people in society, I think what will happen, particularly those who are in the world of work, we, um, we have this horrible kind of twilight period of shutdown, not shutdown. Then it was announced there was a shutdown. We grabbed our laptops, flicked the lights off and headed home. And it was very disjointed, it was, but it was, it was very fast in a way. Yeah. And I think human beings tend to latch onto some degree of certainty. So I think I'll speak for myself is, I assumed one day you'd grab your laptop, go back into the office, flick the lights back on, and magically it'd be like one of those films where all the carousels started moving again and we all ah, the music. came back in a matter of seconds. And that was the reality last week. It was going, the, the world of masks, the world of wanting to really connect physically as well as emotionally with people. You've, I've, I've been talking to a lot of my team regularly, but actually the physical seeing, you do. You have hormones, you, you do, it releases a joy. And then suddenly that joy is mingled with fear going, yeah, that person on the tube went past me a little bit faster. That's, that, that's the downside, yeah. Because now each one of us, a kid could kill you. You know what I mean? Uh, this isn't paradise. I'm just saying, I'm, t I'm focused on the one aspect of a lesson I've learned. Yeah, I mean, it's like dodgems out there. Yeah, exactly. I think, don't hold me, you know, move away. No. If you're think... aware of it, it's, it won't. Yeah. When I've you're not aware, you suddenly scream at a kid that you're in trouble. Yeah. Ruby, I've got a, a very heartwarming kind of, um, pre-question that came in from a, a, a lady called Dorothea and um, she talks about um, she's older she's on her own she's been now isolated for over to three months she's not seeing her family um, and she talks about you know people uh, we are advised to live in the present however the present is really horrible and challenging for people like me living alone in an older age group it's not possible to make plans for the future, which is still uncertain. I find myself alone at home day and night, having nightmares and vivid dreams regularly. 
as well as having intrusive thoughts about the past and reliving past events and feeling quite down at times. And she goes on and, and I, I just, she's basically at the end is, is give, give me some clues about how I might have better coping devices for this period that still for certain groups might go on for a lot longer than others of us. Um, any, any thoughts and any advice? Well, from you? Look, how do I know? You know, we're all different fingerprints, but just Dorothea, come to frenzelcafe.org. You'll meet your ilk. You know, I mean, once, it, once you start talking, that's how trauma works. Nothing goes away. P.S. Whoever told you to live in the present, but that's a bigger discussion. But um, you need company. You need human company and you need some kindness. I, I, if you can't get out of the house, we have to start looking for substitutes. Otherwise, that frazzle thing, which is, oh, my God, this is going to go on forever. You know, this is all dialogue. It's not reality. You know, you might be in. But tomorrow, the world might end. Tomorrow, there might be a vaccine. But anyway, this isn't. Everybody's got this self-talk. I'm talking to people who have, their kids are screaming in the background. Their, their husbands are making them crazy. Other women, oh, totally alone and terrified to go out. Other, we're all in the same predicament. It's not a contest. Who's got it worse? But connect as fast as you can. I mean, if she's got relatives or friends, maybe they could just bang on the window. It's somebody, she could start writing letters, you know, emails to people sending love without asking for anything. It's an impossible scenario. I mean, if I didn't create Frazzled, I would say, I don't know what to do. I, I, it's not the only answer, it's all I've got. But it's, it's an idea of, I think being, you know, we're terribly British in a lot of ways and we're quite reserved. So. I think we have to we'll be don't give me that. Don't give me this British thing. I mean, I'm living in this country now 35 years. These people will not shut up. If you go to America, a lot of times it's crap. You think it's communication, but it's just air noise. Fear is fear. It's international. Okay. The, you know, there is no break. Once people start communicating, they become human. If they don't, your insides don't know where you come from. So, um, and we liberate each other. So I don't, don't give me the British thing. No, I, it was actually, in my, in my defense, what I was saying is we, we like to be invited in. Well, I'm and inviting you. you are invi that, that's exactly what I was going to say is, Dorothea and anybody else who's on this call or anybody else who does it, you are invited. That's right. the point is you don't necessarily, if your present communities aren't working for you in the way that they traditionally did, or if you were feeling lonely before, so quite a lot of people in this country were feeling very lonely yep. for this, and this has made it worse, is don't feel that somehow you've got to invent this on your own. I mean, Ruby's done a phenomenal job in creating this environment where you can go and she's just invited you. You know, the, the, it's, it's out there. It's a big, you know, nice little thing with gold leaf around the edge. It's being posted to everybody out there. Um, I think that's really important to know that we're invited. I have, I can, I can be proactive without being rude or being intrusive yeah. or whatever. I can go to form a community, and also, in a way, um, the anonymous nature of it. I was just going to say, you're anonymous. You don't have to use your real name. Uh, you know, you can uh, choose to turn off the screen. Um, the point is, there are. We had somebody a few a few times saying, you know. Um, to speak and now I am I never feel like I exist but all these faces make me feel that I'm here it's just touching when they start to go yeah. people really never felt that they are here or that they're um appreciated so uh you know Dorothea I'd love to identify yourself when you come unless you'd like to be completely anonymous no, that's lovely. That's really helpful because that's a very, very tangible thing. I've um, got another question about somebody who struggles with OCD and anxiety. And, and that has obviously been fed during this period. Now, I know you've talked about obsessive compulsion and anxiety previously. Can you just think about how that's obviously a pre-existing pre thing that then has got worse? And then some of us who might not have suffered it before suddenly start to feel anxious feelings that they might not have recognized or might not have felt previously. Yeah, it's because I've been uh, tracking this a little bit. In the beginning, 
I'd say most people got <laughs> obsessive compulsive because when you take away all our distractions, um, we, in the beginning, you don't really want to face this horror of having to look at who you really are. So I was hoovering um, most of the days, once I even was trying to get a stain out of the carpet and I scrubbed for about 40 minutes and realized it was a sunbeam. Um, I just, you just, everybody did, or a lot of people didn't want to look up and that, that compulsion was really driving a lot of people crazy. On the other hand, it really is a disease. So the difference between the frazzled and the illness of OCD. Yeah, I'm sure this has exasperated it because there's no, when there's no distraction, you're left at the mercy of all the habits of your brain. And if that habit is to switch on and off the light, you're gonna do, you know, you, uh, one of the, I think they do, um, some of the therapies are to distract you. <laughs> now there's no distraction. That's all you'll be able to face. So don't get mad at yourself. Everybody yeah. who's got OC, you know, is suffering. I know, actually, it's funny. I, I, I often joke that I'm quite a hypochondriac. And of course, a pandemic just lets you run riot around that. Is You've got time yeah. in your hands to think about, um, the, 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 I stubbed my fingertip. That's because I'm losing my mental faculties. I'm now senile. I'm now... Uh, I have that too. Not my finger, but everything. Yeah. No, I know, but you just do. And because you have that space, because you're overly anxious generally, you, uh, it is very easy to slip on to catastrophize. Your biggest, yeah, your biggest fear, which is yeah. I'm losing my mind. Yeah. Um, and actually, it was funny. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a doctor and... They're saying on one hand, people are not engaging with doctors as much because they feel guilty about not having the pandemic, but actually being ill in different ways, which is obviously an, another very serious ramification of this is how many people will die of cancer, how many people will have other ailments, physical as well as mental, as you say. But then also is there's, there's the people who then spiral around something because they've got time to think this is that is that is that i'm now in a box and they're lowering me down into the ground within 30 seconds of stubbing your finger so i think there is a real piece around that that i think people have to start to recognize some of their own behaviors that they might not have recognized before i was interesting where this particular um, member of the audience had said i suffer from ocd that's already pre-recognized. Some people won't necessarily right. realize that's what well, they... I think the, um, the electricity really needs to be shut on and off. I mean, to be aware that they've got OCD is half the battle. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, um, you mentioned before about families and kids in the background, etc. How How do you... So we talked a little bit about the loneliness thing, which I think is, is a very obvious one. But actually the stress of navigating, particularly those people who are in confined environments, it's, it's wonderful, I suppose, if you've got the country home with 20 bedrooms and you, know, you can each retire to a wing when you're getting annoyed with each other. For those people with two young children um, and a one bedroom house and you're meant to homeschool and you're meant to have one computer to do your work, how, how do you navigate as partners is there any clues there at all as as kind of those family units because that's a different set of challenges for people no i have no idea <laughs> you tell me i know we're doing actually remarkably well in our house we were not predicted what to be doing well. but i think it is it is that space. i can't imagine what would you do because your brain gets closed more and more crushed with the pressure of everybody's needs what happens to you? I don't know. Do you have a secret you could maybe share with us? Well, I just went around the house shouting at everybody not to use the Wi-Fi while I'm doing this because I said, if my Wi-Fi goes wrong at this point because your phone in America or you're watching YouTube how to do knitting videos, then all hell will break loose. So I your think... suggestion is you just shout at everybody. Yeah, that was, I was quite... I <laughs> reckon, people are taking I notes. I point out that I did actually start with... I have to say I'm quite stressed at the moment, so therefore it would be helpful if, and then it became a bit more directive than it probably should have been. Yeah. But, um, my, my partner and my daughter responded well and the dog went and hid in the garden. Um, so that was good. And that was why when we came on earlier, I wasn't, were you like, where is Mark? When we were talking to the other colleagues and I was running around the house trying to find the doors. 
because this for me is interesting because I, I'm quite the perfectionist. So when we're at the college, when you and I have interviewed on stage, I know how that environment works. Whereas actually this bit for me creates a different thing. We have um, the Minister of State for Skills coming for a virtual tour of the college tomorrow. Now, I haven't got a clue what a virtual tour is meant to look like. I know what a tour is. I'll usually take her in the lift, etc. So we've had about 48 dress rehearsals. Not that I'm, I have certain obsessive characteristics, obviously, but um, we, we, all, we all have our challenges. Um, the, the question around, one of the, we have a number of questions here about um, yoga and meditation and people trying to start it for the first time and finding it very difficult to kind of get into it when they haven't got a background in it. Um, that kind of physical slowing down piece. Do you have any thoughts about that? Is it, is it a general helper in terms of doing something physical as well as mental? Or can you, do the, can you find ways of de-stressing yourself that doesn't actually have to combine the physical as well as the mental? Well, again, physical is mental. Um, some people are reacting, you know, when they read about people doing yoga or learning Japanese, get even more upset because they, it makes them feel more inert. So I'm not going to say, you know, it depends who you are. It's like saying, stop drinking. <laughs> if you're too stressed, there's too much cortisol going on, you can't think straight. So it's not helpful for somebody to say, now is a good time to get healthy. I, again, I'm sorry, uh, maybe I'm fanatic. Mark, but um, the Frazzle Cafes begin and end. I lead them in a mindfulness. And even if they've never done it, by the way, the whole thing isn't about Frazzle. I explain it. I do it for one minute. You can feel the cortisol come down. I give an explanation as to why that happens. And then we're on a flat playing field. But it's like learning anything like uh, tennis or a language, is you have to do it all the time and really uh, understand it's not difficult, it's a consistency. But if you read, if you're interested, Mark Williams' book or my book, Frazzled, where yeah. I'm imitating, I mean, I'm, I'm making it funny what Mark is saying, even though he gave me permission to do that. And I make it more practical so you could do it while you're gardening. Um, is that learn from an expert if it's, or go to Headspace, that's, that'll train you. And if it, it's, it's a horrible, it's like learning piano, the first few days are kind of horrible. And gradually, gradually, you start to, like yoga too, if it eventually starts to make your mind slow down, or not slow down, but just be more aware. There's no words for this, because it sounds like I'm saying this is the goal of it. Um, then it's for you, and keep the practice up. But I wouldn't say, here, start this, or start this. It's too um, challenging. But, you know, there are people who teach mindfulness. You can read about it. And if it's your thing, then do it. You have to do something, though. People, we always think, well, when's somebody going to give me a tool? No, nobody is. If you really want to settle that cortisol and get off the frazzle track, which doesn't mean you'll be blank. It means at least you won't be anxious about anxiety and create the stories. It gets down that second tier. Then you have to do something like mindfulness or yoga or tai chi or martial arts or there's infinite possibility. Well, no, many, but it's brain training. It's not sudoku. It's not butterfly collecting. It's not mindfulness through drawing. Those are distractions. But mindfulness and yoga, it's a, there's this particular technique that exercises a part of your brain, and that's the only thing that works. You know, is bringing the focus into the body. Otherwise, the mind will take you on rides. You're going to live 90% of your life mind wandering, and then you're going to die. <laughs> so you have to do something if you really want to get this uh, ability to be able to investigate your life. Otherwise, it's too frightening. And I think mindfulness and yoga and all those give you an anchor. So when the brain starts going crazy and all of our minds do, you've got an anchor. You've got safety to come back to. It's, unless you're a natural. You know, some people won't know what I'm talking about. They're able to think clearly. They're able to enjoy the weather. They're fine. I've never met anybody like that, but I, I know they're out there. I think it's funny. You, you touched on, well, you touched on so many good points there. But one of the things is, 
a lot a lot of people are beating themselves up because they were um should have done something. I, i've you know i've been locked down for 14 weeks i haven't written the great american novel i haven't learned how to do topiary with the um tree at the back i haven't i haven't i haven't and and that has become i think particularly at the beginning there was almost like a competition with all of these the amount of how we are. Have made sourdough we are. bread. Have you made sourdough bread, Ruth? No, know, I eat it though. No, no, but seriously. I'm making toilet paper because I think that might be a commodity. Yes, exactly. Out, well, of, out of flour. Yeah, and, and because, well, I mean, if you look at the beginning of this, it was, you know, and I, I liked it in one way that this is an opportunity to do things, but only if it was an opportunity. Yeah. As opposed to something else I will now beat myself up over. But because it's a very good reflection on how you, we used to live. It's nothing new. We were always like this. How many books did you read? I read more. How far do you jog? I read more. It's the way we always were, except in isolation. Now it's in your face. Yeah. And I mean, what is, is, is that... I, th I think that bit has died down over the last few weeks. I don't think there has been that much of that competitiveness. I think that that has there's found a different rhythm in society. I hope, so. I hope you're right. Yeah. That the question good. now, I suppose, is I've got a few questions as we we come into the last ten minutes. Is is have you got any thoughts about if if for those people who have found good behaviours during this and have found a better sense of space and a bit more self-reflection for those people who've done it how do you maintain it when the world the kind of carousels start turning again how well, everybody has that question you know i hear it every day how do you maintain the kind of maybe insight you found yeah i don't know but i hope i hope we all do yeah. it might mean we have to change our lives unless you work you know you, you know, necessity will pull, you know, mean you got to go right back to the grind. It's no good if you need money. Yeah. But, but maybe you, there's a way to change your life. Every, a lot of people that are interesting now are saying, I don't want to lose this of all ages. So let's talk again. <laughs> yeah. I think what's interesting for me is, um, is the work, the world of work, the working habits. So a friend of mine has been responsible for the starting to re-engage their organization, big international organization. And uh, they had uh, 1,700 employees based in London. And they went out and said, for those of you who want to return, we understand some of you want to return, um, we, we need to know the numbers and the protocols. And they kind of came back and said, there were 18 people out of 1,700. And then two, uh, then, over the weekend, it went down to 16 people out of 17. Who wanted what? Who wanted what? Wanted to go back to the office. Um, which I thought was, so literally 99.01% of people didn't want to go back to the office anymore, which I thought was really fascinating. Yeah. Um, so maybe something is changing in society. Now, I've got one question, which I love. You'll probably throw it back to me and say that. Okay, you. Pr I love the way to, you practically have your own section in bookshops now of the books that you've written. What do you yourself read? Give, give us some, this is a, not necessarily about oh. mental health or well-being, but what, what, what are your favorite books? What do you love? Well, during this, I had no concentration at all, right? You know, you've like nothing. It was just, but now that it's um, going on and on, uh, um, now I can, not a long time, but A, um, I think because I'm isolated and I don't know when I'll stop, I mean, I'm imposing it on myself. I'm reading Walden. Because right. I really may pull back from doing what I did and I like isolation. It's gone the other way. I was always a person who needed a lot of people and I was scared of loneliness and I always felt it. And now this may last another half an hour. I don't want people. Um, <laughs> I love being unfrazzled. Uh, and so I'm reading Walden. And also A Walk in the Woods by um, Bill Bryson. And uh, what was it? Um, there was a few, I, I do a few at the time, but I'll tell you what's weird is I was never, uh, you know, I'm a late bloomer as far as education. So now I'm watching all of um, Civilization oh. uh, narrated by Kenneth Clark. I never had time to watch this. 
I mean, who knew? I, uh, now I want to take every course. And there's a brilliant guy, I have to look up his name, it's a Polish name, who does a history of art program. I mean, I'm gobsmacked. I never had time for this stuff. And now I'm obsessed. I'm telling the weirdest thing of this pandemic is that your old wallpaper comes down much quicker and you could grow into something else. But I might be talking out of my, you know, backside and next week I'm at, uh, I don't know, whatever yeah. I was doing before. And also you can forgive yourself for doing that. It's not yeah. so, it, But it, what I'm doing is really interesting, I think. Yeah. Now, I, one book I would recommend for everybody is actually your last book, Frazzled, because I thought that no, was... No, the last one was How to Be Human. How to Be Human, sorry, because I, I have, I have, I'm pointing over to the other end of the bookshelf, I have both of them there. But tell us, you've got a new book coming out in September, so yeah. give us a bit of a sneak peek about... Get um, it now on Amazon, it's called And Now for the Good News, dot, 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 to the future with love. How about that timing? Um, yeah. And I wrote it in the last two years where I went around the world and I knew I wanted to change my life. Oh, you know, it's always about me. And so uh, I wanted to see where the green shoots were of good news, what people were doing in education, in business, in community, in technology, where it, was flir it would flourish into making the human race even a more wonderful place because everything is seeped in bad news. Everything, it's become our addiction. That's why people can't stop talking politics. So I, because I, I know where we pay our attention defines who we are. So for two years, I had the pleasure of going to Finland and watching how they educate and going to um, communities, eco communities, where, and they're, this isn't hippie anymore. These are sensational. Where, put your money where your mouth is. It is, it's zero emissions, but they're beautiful. And um, there's 10,000 of them. And then I went to businesses uh, like Patagonia, the sportswear company in Ventura, California, who for 40 years are so um, environmentally friendly that when you buy something, the ad is don't ever um, buy anything else. You send it back, they fix it, they send it back. And people go, oh yeah, do they make a lot of money? They make a fortune because the public trusts them. And they have all these things in place, you know, that they have to help the local community. There's places in Unilever, Ben and Jerry's, Dove. There's companies now that are creating a new um, capitalism that make a lot of money. So I read these books, which are great, called One is Conscious Capitalism and one is called Firms of Endearment. And so I met those guys and did really go to businesses that are re redefining who they are. So in a way, it's a guide for you want to change your life, go to these places. Um, and I was going to do that. Not dramatically, but you know, there were people I wanted to meet again, and um, I will when this is over. So that's a guidebook to what is possible. I, I talk about serendipity. The title is just brilliant for the time. So, God, you know, talk about, you know, if, if, if you haven't been doing it for the last two years, you'd think you're a marketing genius. Talk, because I think people do at the end of this will want good news. Mm -hmm. and I like this idea of sending it forward to the future. And to know it's out there. I mean, that's the thing. It's not like we have to start there. I, I keep calling it the green shoots. There is stuff where you see what people are doing and your jaw hits the floor. And uh, it's happening under this, under the umbrella of horror and bad news and, oh, the world will never change. So anyway, that's been a privilege. So that's September that's coming out. You can pre-order it now on Amazon and various other good booksellers. Um, and obviously, hopefully there'll be a big surge now of people doing it. Um, I'd love to have you back actually at the point when that go and kind of goes on. Definitely. Um, because I think it's, it's people having things to look forward to. I think a lot of the things in the news is, is yes, the gym might open, but there's only one person allowed in and every five hours. Everything now comes with a set of instructions as long as you're armed. And just actually having unalloyed joy some things that are actually positive to talk about i think that's that's a lovely um lovely title and it's uh, the way you describe the book i think that's absolutely magnificent um what we're getting just in terms just so you know because i don't think you can see the q a ruby is is that we're getting a load of comments from people who've done the frazzled cafe that's and just wonderful so you're getting a lot of testimonials which is great by the way, just one point somebody made out is it's frazzled, 
cafe. It's a D because some awesome. people have been putting in saying it's Frazzle. And so just to make sure people get to the right link. Um, and what we will do is we'll send a little sort of thank you email out to everybody afterwards. And we'll put the link to the cafe and also the link to Ruby's new book. Um, I think my, my final question, which I'm, I'm, I'm begging you answer in the right way, is, is the, there is cause for optimism after all of this. I mean, there has been a huge amount of negativity. It has been very difficult for a lot of people. But actually, one of the things I've got, and I'm very energized by this over the last hour, is, is if you focus on the positives around it and try to not, not, not dismiss the difficulties people have, but yeah. actually try and focus on some of those things, some good can come out of this. Is that what yeah, you... Well, except positive to a person who's got depression or whatever exasperates their depression. So the main thing, first of all, I think is to find some tool to get that cortisol down, either through community or meditate mindfulness or, yoga, you know, or listening to some kind of headspace, you know, just get it down. You can't make decisions if you're in a red mist. It's impossible. And don't beat yourself up because you're in a red mist because there is a red mist. Brilliant. Ruby Wax, it is just, it's such a delight to have you back. It's always a little stressful in advance because I'm not quite idea where you're going to go on things, but it's, it's just brilliant. And you are a ray of sunshine um, in these times. Um, I think your idea of Frazzled Cafe has, was yeah. ahead of the time. And now the adaptivity of taking it online, I think, has, has probably made the huge difference to many hundreds and thousands of people in the country. And hopefully as people on this might take and get involved with them and also tell their friends yeah. that thing. So what we will do everybody is we'll send the link out to everyone afterwards. And as I said, the link also to Ruby's new book and I can thoroughly recommend how to be human and frazzled and the, the whole back catalog of Ruby. Um, they're all marvelous. And I just thank you for sharing this last thank hour you. with us, Ruby. It oh, was it's really fun, Mark. I like talking to you. And, um, Thank you. And thank you to the marvellous Charmaine, who has thank you. worked marvellously. Thank you, Charmaine. And um, one, one just little thought. Um, a comment just came in from um, one of our deaf students. Is Can um, everybody remember that um, when we go to masks and things like that, that can be very exclusive, uh, exclusionary for deaf people because obviously they rely on being able to be visible with um, the mouths. So I think that's a little PSA, public service announcement at the end. But our deaf community have had lots of isolation and lots of different forms of isolation um, predating this. Yeah. So be conscious of um, other communities like the deaf community and ensure that um, you in your re-engagement society make their lives easy as well. So that's one just little comment I saw came up just at the last minute. But for those of you part of the City Lit community, thank you so much for being supportive of us, joining us online for this. And hopefully, as Ruby says, you can learn art history, you can learn politics, you can learn music. At City Lit during this period, we're doing as much as we can online. We have over 1,200 courses at the moment running. And then come in September, we'll probably start to have some things back in the college, but the majority of things while we're working out social distancing will remain online. And um, thank you for the, the support that you've given us during this period. For those of you who just came to see Ruby and we've lured you in, City Lit's pretty good as well. So maybe you've discovered that as well as Frazzled Cafes here. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I, I am delighted that we've had one of our really esteemed fellows and a great friend of ours, Ruby Wax, you're magnificent. Keep thank on you. doing the amazing work you're doing. And um, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you. Don't, don't shout at your family. No, I will not. And don't shout at your family, even if they are using the Wi-Fi too much. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.